welcome to Total War Three Kingdoms' new DLC, Mandate of Heaven. This DLC gives you so much in terms of new units and new ways to play the game. The amount of work that has gone into this content is outstanding. Let's dive in and take a look. You join me playing as Emperor Lu Hong. Yes, that's correct. For the first time in Total War Three Kingdoms, you can play as the main Han himself, complete with his own units and mechanics. Mandate of Heaven takes place 12 years before the Three Kingdoms main campaign, making it a great jumping off point for new players, as well as veteran players who want to experience the events that began the Three Kingdoms period. Depending on how you choose to play will affect the events after 190. We start you off in the winter of 182, but you join me in the summer of 184, where all hell has broken loose. The Emperor gives you a unique starting position, never seen in Three Kingdoms. As the Emperor, you start with everything, land, money, and power, but your empire is on the brink of collapse. Starvation grips your people, and the eunuchs have perverted the old bureaucratic ways and have infested your court. While the eunuchs hold majority in your court, they will give you a host of debuffs, including negative trade contracts, increased construction costs, and a massive deficit per turn. Playing as the Emperor, you will have to deal with three major parties, the bureaucrats, dynasty, and the warlords. Each giving majority power in your court will provide different bonuses or penalties. The objectives are simple. Balance your court, defeat the rebels, and above all, survive. The challenging part is knowing how, but being the emperor of a collapsing empire was never going to be easy. You may have noticed that the emperor himself isn't a character on the map. You govern from your palace. Even though the Emperor and Empress aren't playable characters, it doesn't mean our artists have spared any expense on their art and design. One of your greatest generals is your brother-in-law, He Jing, a fiery, dutiful leader also known as the Butcher of the Her. He has a deep hatred for the eunuchs and therefore the bureaucrats. You can see he has a minus 80% upkeep for the new Imperial units meaning your incredibly powerful Imperial Army only costs you 500 per turn while He Jing is in command. Speaking of He Jing, you can see him about to engage Nanyon's Jade Mine. The Yellow Turbans have instigated their rebellion, springing ambushes all over the country. Being so close to my own province, I can't let this go unanswered. Let's show them what the might of the Empire can do. Let's take a closer look at a few of the Imperial units under your command. They come with all formations unlocked from the start and all wear the gold and black plate armor of the finest professional fighting force China has to offer. The Imperial Sword Guard are equipped with swords, tower shields, and heavy armor. They are your ultimate frontline unit, steadfast with good morale. The Imperial Lancer Cavalry are armed with a two-handed lance and wear heavy armor. With the passive Mighty Knockback ability, which has only been seen on hero units, they have a tremendously high charge bonus. These guys will obliterate most anything that gets in their way. The Imperial Household Cavalry, with their swords and shields, can not only charge into the enemy and deal a massive amount of damage, but stick around in the thick of combat to fight instead of having to retreat, regroup, and charge again. And my personal favorite, the Imperial Palace Crossbowmen. These crossbows can be fired and reloaded with relative speed and accuracy. In the hands of these well-trained soldiers, many enemy units won't come close to your front line. I'll leave you with some highlights of my decisive victory against the rebel scum.
They put up a good fight, but they were no match for the might of the Emperor's finest. The Imperial Cavalry units, if used right, will decimate anything that stands in their way. But as you can see, the Imperial units have a huge replenishment penalty. And with this massive deficit I have per turn, another army would bankrupt me in short order, meaning I'll have to pick and choose my battles wisely. Let's skip ahead to the year 187. You can see I've managed to get a handle on that massive deficit and my population is doing better. Using political influence, I've removed and expelled a lot of the bureaucratic influence poisoning my court, meaning that my relationship with the other factions has been getting better, but there is still a long way to go. Political influence builds per turn. You can increase the amount with the administration office, as you can see here. Dispelling distance isn't the only thing you can use political influence for. You can annex lands off your lords or anyone who has agreed to your mandated rule, or even take their cities. Of course, doing this too much will make the lord very unhappy with you, so choose your time wisely. While I've been fighting fires within my own lands and court, the Zhang brothers, led by Zhang Zhu, have grown in strength. You can see the lands north of the Yellow River have started to fall to their dogmatic doctrine. Ignoring this uprising and leaving it this long has been a big mistake. The only way I can see to stay this tide is to cut the head off the snake. Zhang Zhu keeps to himself at the very north of the map. Not an easy place to get to, but I've spotted a weakness. His west flank is completely unguarded. Doing a rather costly deal with a young and slightly thinner Dong Zhuo has allowed me military access over the mountains, allowing me to strike directly at his western flank. As you can see, I've caught him on the march. Killing him will really weaken the rebellion and may give me leverage to barter for a much needed time of peace. Let's jump into the battle. One new amazing feature are battlefield deployables, stakes, towers, and oil. All are deployable the same as any unit. You gain them through the military branch of the tech tree. Zhongzhu has mainly infantry and a few horses, so I'm gonna use the stakes to guard my flank and drench the ground in front of me in oil, all while bombarding him with arrows. His Messengers of Heaven cavalry can do massive damage to my range unit, so my first priority is to focus fire on them and not let them get too close. Here's what happened when the Butcher of the Her and the General of Heaven met in the field. Even with their leader dead, they are resolute in their devotions. The other brothers refuse my proposal of peace. Unfortunately, this war is far from over. With hidden political battles still raging in my courts, the yellow turbans taking my lands in delusions of grandeur from my lords, this will be a hard fight if I want my dynasty to survive long into the future. Playing the Emperor is a fun challenge that forces you to think and play the game differently. The odds are stacked against you from the start, so failure is a real option. Will you go the way of history and crumble into antiquity? Or can you carry your empire forward into the main Three Kingdoms campaign and rebuild your empire back to its former strengths? How would you play the Emperor? 
total tyrannical control or a more measured politician? Leave a comment and let us know. And don't forget to check out the Mandate of Heaven official trailer now live on our YouTube channel.